Hey everyone, it's Casey Vineyard here at Warner's Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. We are so excited to have you here as we talk about our newest at-home mission through Mission Conservation, celebrating Earth Day through nature photography. We have had the honor to partner with Nature's Best Photography to launch this month's mission. Throughout this month, you'll get to meet multiple partners to learn about the exquisite eye of photography, as well as promoting conservation through Earth Day awareness. This mission is a perfect way to learn about conservation as a piece of art. In order to play this really fun mission, all you have to do is log on to our mission conservation page at www.wondersofwildlife.org forward slash mission dash conservation. That will, bring, that will bring you to the mission conservation webpage. On this website, I will bring your attention down to get the app. Once you click that app and get it downloaded, that'll take you to download the Agents of Discovery app, which you will need to play any mission conservation mission. Once you have that app downloaded, create a user account and log in. Hit the search bar, type in mission conservation, and this is where all of our at-home missions will pop up for you to play. Once you have that, map, that mission popped up and loaded, we are going to direct you down to another part of the website where it says schedule of missions and activities. This tab will show you all of the missions that we have live, including our current mission, Celebrating Earth Day Through Nature Photography. Under this tab, you will also find our activity guide that we have specifically made for you at home. There will be a crafts, an awesome outdoor activity, and something that you can do to promote conservation for Earth Day awareness. So I'm currently standing here in our Audubon exhibit. This exhibit houses beautiful displays of nature photography and art. And that brings me to our partner of the day. We have Dr. Gord Court, a wildlife biologist with the government of Alberta. Dr. Gord Court, how are you doing today? Super, Casey. I hope you can see me. I'm uh, sitting in my basement, but hope to get out to do a little adventuring uh, with the camera later on today. Sounds great. What do you have for us today? Oh, uh, just a, a short uh, presentation. Hopefully, uh, it would be of interest to sort of my opinions on how a person might get started in wildlife photography and some of the things they might want to think about, some of the gear they might want to uh, uh, invest in and uh, some of the things they want to think about uh, that are uh, important when you're, when you're out there uh, trying to photograph uh, uh, the beautiful animals and, and plants that uh, exist along with us on this planet. So Dr. Gore, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'm a wildlife biologist with the Alberta Environmental Environment, Environment and Parks in Alberta, Canada. Um, my background is in zoology. I, um, I studied uh, an undergraduate degree in the University of Alberta. I also did a master's degree on peregrine falcons in the Canadian Arctic uh, for a, uh, a master's degree, master of science degree. And then I went to New Zealand uh, for my PhD and I thought I would work in the nice warm climate of New Zealand, but uh, I realized quite quickly that I had an opportunity to travel to the Antarctic and, uh, and study uh, marine pollution in, in, in birds uh, there, uh, because it is the cleanest place on earth and quite uh, ironically, it's one of the best places to look for pollution in, in, uh, in birds as you uh, have no local sources of pollutants. Everything they have in them are likely to come from somewhere else on the planet. So. I did my PhD down there and came back and now I work on endangered species uh, programs here in, in the province of Alberta, Canada. And I've always uh, appreciated the chance to carry a camera and well, I'll just get a chance to, to get uh, intimate looks at some species. So it's always nice to be able to uh, contribute that way in, in, uh, in delivering photographs of, of rare animals or endangered animals. Uh, uh, and also uh, it uh, is something that can always be used by the government. I, I, I participate in populating our, our digital library in the government as well. So we have lots of photographs uh, available to us. So I think uh, if I sh share the screen, is that uh, Kendra sharing the screen or is that me sharing the screen? That's me. 
Okay, Kendra, do you want if what I had, did add? A, oh, I added a few extra pictures the other day. If you wanted to try uh, letting me share the screen, I, I can do that if you want. All right, will do. Okay, yeah, I just added a few extra ones for people who may be interested. We'll see how this works. Um, but it uh, there were a couple of extra points that I wanted to uh, to bring up, and uh, we'll see if that works. Uh, okay. If not, Kendra's got the backup. Did you guys get the, my new screen? Sure did. Okay, so we're ready to go. <laughs> this is the only, actually the only photograph I have of a digital uh, signal lens reflex camera, but it's unfortunately under a great gray owl here. But uh, uh, this is a, a typical uh, day in the life of Gord here in, uh, in Alberta. Uh, and I do get out in all kinds of weather and all kinds of uh, conditions. Uh, and I do like taking pictures because uh, pictures are so strong. We all know the uh, expression, one picture is worth a thousand words. Um, good photographs are incredibly good at uh, relaying poignant messages. Uh, just there's nothing you can write that, that uh, a photograph can't do much, much better, I think. And, uh, and it can evoke interest in a wide variety of people in a wide variety of topics. So. Um, it, it, it really uh, is, is an, uh, important that way. And it also can create a material record of events. If you, if you want to tell people about uh, uh, a particular fact that you uh, have discovered uh, you, and you want to document it, you can document it in many ways, but uh, photographically is, is just as good as any other uh, medium. And it's uh, hand, hand, very handy that way. And I was talking to Casey earlier, she's sharing special or rare encounters with wild animals, like uh, very secretive species. If you have a chance to see an animal in your viewfinder from a few feet away that you rarely, rarely get a chance to see, some of the details on them are just astounding. And it's a really addictive thing uh, to do that. And, uh, uh, but you always wanna share that with other people. So uh, a good photograph taken at that particular moment is a very, very, uh, fun thing to share with people and it, it has the capacity to to entertain and amaze people uh, and including yourself. So when I, when I, I, there's a lot of cameras available now and some of the very sophisticated cameras that are in cell phones can be even used in, in capturing uh, um, images of nature. Um, and also there's uh, mer this fabulous uh, technology with mirrorless cameras. But for most people now, in, in, when you're looking at expense and you're looking at, um, uh, getting into the wildlife photography and uh, keeping the expenses down and having the opportunity to pick up used gear perhaps or uh, or very inexpensive uh, digital cameras. You want to have a digital single lens reflex camera, a digital SLR. And that's the, the best way to, to, uh, to get into this. Uh, and I, any of the big four companies, Nikon, Canon, Pentis, Pentax, Olympus, uh, there are others too, uh, but some are very expensive like Sony. Um, but these are the ones you want to stay with or you want to uh, get into. You can probably buy a digital SLR camera uh, uh, brand new for probably less than $400 US um, and probably get uh, much better deals even than used. I mean, some of these cameras are quite robust. They probably don't break that often. And you can pick up a camera body, a digital single lens reflex camera body fairly cheaply. And uh, the, this, the digital lens, uh, digital single DSLR cameras, the nice thing about them is you get to see through the lens and you get to see exactly what the lens is focusing on. So that's what, um, what makes it so uh, handy for nature photography. And I could offer some advice, don't put a lot of dollars um, into the camera body itself. It's often uh, uh, something that people are keen on making, a, you get a really nice camera. If you have extra dollars to spend, go for the lenses that you uh, uh, may have available to you. And uh, that, that opens up a wide variety of situations for you to uh, experiment with different lenses. The camera just catches the image, the lenses do the work. And they, um, uh, that, uh, I definitely recommend putting your money into a lens. When you buy a camera body too, uh, you will have, you'll see that all, virtually all of these digital SLR cameras will have automatic modes or, uh, for ap more aperture or shutter priorities. This is uh, uh, basically just um, ways to allow you to control um, or not to control uh, the way the photograph is exposed in the camera. And I'll describe some of those things a little bit later. But the nice thing too is to have an ability 
to override these things if possible. It's very desirable to use your own skills and imagination and to develop your skills if you're able to override it and use the camera totally manually. It's, it's often pretty, pretty uh, handy that way. And remember, some of them uh, are also very good at having fully adjustable flash um, uh, capabilities. And that's uh, something that we'll talk about a little later and it's, it's handy to have, so. So with these, uh, with a, a, a moderate lens, lens, moderate telephoto lens, or uh, uh, even uh, even if a very expensive lens, you can go out anywhere, including your public parks, like where you see common species, like a, a Canada goose here. Uh, you, these are good subjects to shoot. Uh, they're often challenging ch subjects to shoot in certain times of the year. They often are bright animated in terms of their behavior. Uh, there's lots of fighting Canada geese going on right now. It's lots of action shots. Uh, you can do that in a public park, or you can take your maybe you take your camera on holidays, oops, and uh, and you get a chance to photograph whales. You go out on a whale watching boat. If you have your camera with you all the time, you have your skill sets developing or you're already developed. Uh, you're able to uh, sit there and and pick off uh, photographs that might be better than your average person if you have already thought it through and you're thinking about what uh, photographic opportunities are coming down the pipe. So metering modes, just to, when your camera has a light meter in it and it, it'll, it will accept uh, metering from various places in the actual uh, screen that you're, you're shooting. So if you want to look at it, you can actually meter on particular spots. You can change the metering mode of your camera. You can you ask it to sort of just get the metering from the center part of the frame, or you can get it to take a matrix metering, which is to meter off the entire screen. And that, that the, these various metering modes can be changed quite readily on even fairly inexpensive SLR cameras. And they can be very handy to when you wanna shoot certain things and in certain challenging situations. Here's a good example of a, of a white bird and a white background. This is an adult male snowy owl uh, in, uh, in Alberta in the winter time. Uh, if you were to allow, allow the camera to matrix meter this, just meter the whole thing, your camera tries to uh, even everything out. And actually, if you, if you just let the camera go on automatic, it would deliver a, uh, a photograph where everything's gray and it's not white, white, like a snowy owl should be. So what you do here is you probably meter off of the bird, if you could, uh, maybe when the bird was still, if particularly good, meter off the bird and then adjust, let, adjust for the, uh, the exposure that way. Um, that's an example of where you'd want to spot meter on a bird. Uh, center weight, like you, if, if you just let your camera do this automatically, you just shot this frame, the camera would tend to appreciate the brightness of the snow and the frost on the tree and not necessarily the gray plumage of this great gray owl. So you would uh, often use a center weight of uh, your, your uh, light meter on your camera and just get it to meter off the owl uh, to some degree with a center meter, uh, weighted metering and you are likely to have a much more pleasing result. So I always think with Wayne Lynch is one of the uh, most uh, prolific uh, wildlife photographers in the, in the world. And he always says that you are smarter than your camera. So don't let your camera do all the thinking for you. Uh, if you study how it works and then study these things like metering modes uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then you will, you'll, you'll have a lot more fun with it and you'll be a lot more creative with it as well. So re remember, just don't let the camera do all the work. Uh, if you experiment, and uh, you maybe read up a little bit, and even the camera man manual that comes with the camera, you will understand how things are going and how you can better your photographs. So uh, just in, in terms of how you capture images of, with your camera, uh, you have a bunch of ways that the, the file is going to be delivered to your computer because these are digital cameras. I would always shoot in RAW, which is a, just a selection you make on your camera which just is captures the most information you can possibly uh, capture in a particular image. And it, it's amazing to see uh, how much data can be captured in a single image. My camera now, uh, each time I squeeze the trigger, shoots a, a, a 20 megabyte file, which is um, exactly the same size as the hard drive I had when I was writing my PhD. So that's one photograph is uh, has as much memory as my our storage capacity as my computer did uh, uh, not too long ago or you know ways ago but uh, it's amazing how much data goes into a raw file the nice thing too if you made a mistake in the field if you're shooting raw you can adjust this in the computer and actually make 
uh, your, uh, correct a mistake on the computer, on the digital file. And you can do this both with your, um, your raw converter and also in some of the Photoshop or other uh, programs that allow you to edit your photographs. It's very, very fun to do. And uh, you can learn a lot uh, away from your camera, uh, behind the computer, and actually looking at improving uh, the photographs that you take. And home printing these things or just storing them on the, on the computer is very, very gratifying. A lot of people do this. They put it straight from the computer onto a web page or a Facebook page of some sort and they share their photographs that way. So it's a lot of fun. So uh, just to my, some of the advice that I have with, uh, with photographing wild animals, uh, portraits are nice. It's uh, nice to deliver a nice clean shot of an animal, but try and think about, be, be creative, be unique or at least quirky with what you're doing. Good example is that you have nice photographs of birds at the nest and it's a nice family photograph. It's a portrait and it's, uh, it's not that unusual. It's not that creative. Same with the uh, single bird sitting here. Here's the great, that was a great gray owl family. Here's a great horned owl just sitting in the winter. Uh, you know, if you, uh, if you adjust your image and you adjust your position, uh, maybe make it a little more creative. And in this case, we just moved around a tree and all you, and then you just work the bird so that it's in a position where you are able to make a little more of a creative image uh, when you're shooting the picture. Same thing here, you know, you're walking a nature trail in, uh, in your local woods and you'll see sawwed owl, or in our case, we get boreal owl and sawwed owl. These are very tame animals and will, uh, are quite secure in their hole as long as you don't go up the tree. And uh, you can take a portrait of the bird there and you, uh, but in, in some cases, you know, be creative what you do. In this case, I just uh, walked to the base of the tree and shot up the tree and got kind of a funny looking but different perspective on this particular owl. And that's, that's just thinking about being quirky with your, your shots of animals. You know, it's nice to take a nice portrait, but try and be a little bit different when, when you're shooting. Uh, the other thing too you should, you should understand is that most of your cameras, just the cameras you can buy, the very basic lens that you're gonna come with, if, uh, most of them come with a, a small zoom, like a 24 millimeter to 75 millimeter zoom lens, which allows wide angle lenses or portrait lenses. So the wide angle would be 24, the, wide, uh, the portrait lens would be about 75 or 80 millimeters. So most people would use the portrait lens to shoot a portrait like this. However, when you turn that on its ear, let, why not use the 24 millimeter lens and uh, instead uh, uh, when you're thinking about doing a portrait, uh, change it up and shoot with a wide angle lens in the same scene. Here's a great gray owl nest on an old snag. <clears throat> the first one was shot with about a hundred millimeter lens. And the second shot here was at, with about a 24 millimeter lens. And it really puts the animal into perspective and also its, its environment into perspective for you. And that's just by thinking, okay, what really weird thing could I do here is I shoot this shot. We won't get a really close up, good close up of a great gray owl, but it'll have a, a, a unique um, shot of its, uh, of its nesting uh, uh, site. So that's just by thinking, okay, I, I use a 24 millimeter to shoot um, not just a landscape, but uh, uh, a photograph of an animal in a nest. So it's, it's quite uh, uh, quite different use of it. Same thing here. These are two emperor penguins on the Ross Sea uh, in Antarctica who were incredibly curious of me uh, sitting on the ice. And they basically wouldn't leave me alone. And so I could have shot nice portraits of them with a portrait lens, 80 millimeter or something like that, or even 50 millimeter. But they were so close to me and so curious they were less than probably a foot from me at any one time. They would, in fact, one of them actually tried to stand on me at one point. Uh, and so I'm less than a foot away. So I think, okay, I'll get a landscape shot of these guys, but I'll get it with a, a wide angle lens. So this is a 24 millimeter lens used right at the base of an emperor penguin. And you get a neat different perspective on the animal by using the lens that most people wouldn't think to use under those circumstances. But these guys just wouldn't leave me alone. So I uh, took advantage of the fact that uh, uh, they were close and I shot them with a wide angle lens. Also, I think it's important that you always combine the animal and the landscape in which it lives. And we just had an example of that with the, uh, with the great gray owl uh, with, uh, on, the, on, the, on the snag. But you know, you look at a portrait of a polar bear or a picture of a polar bear, it's filling most of the frame. This could very well have been in a zoo. But uh, this is Churchill, Manitoba, where these animals are waiting for the ice. And I like to think of them more like this. This is what you see when you're in Churchill, typical Arctic weather. And it's a bear waiting for the Hudson Bay to freeze. And it's, uh, it's walking nose into the wind, just waiting for that uh, sea to freeze so it can go out and feed. So it, 
putting putting the animal in the in the perspective uh, of uh, the actual uh, world in which it lives in, in, in which it lives and that that's important for uh, a lot of good good photographs I think in my opinion so flash photography too I mean I mentioned that even well even your uh, your cell phones now have some flash capacity uh, with the uh, at digital SLR cameras often you have a metered fill flash which other words uh, otherwise are means that it's, uh, it's it, the camera meter actually can uh, accept or not accept a certain amount of flash. And these are universally available and they're often fully adjustable so that you can add a tiny amount of light or a lot of light if you need it, if you're in really bad light. So it gives some, uh, some superb results and can really add a little pop to your photograph. So don't, don't think just because digital cameras are um, very good in poor light don't mean doesn't matter it doesn't mean that you won't need a flash at some point and you shouldn't uh abandon the flash altogether here's an example where you have to have full flash or you know and it's not particularly free uh, uh pleasing image but a solid owl visiting a bird feeder in the complete darkness i mean you're not going to see it any other way other than to blast it with full flash uh, however here's a boreal owl midday uh poor light in a snowstorm and you can see it's, a, it's not a bad photograph, but I just put a, an adjustable flash in there and just a touch of light and you see what it does. No, no flash and then a touch of light, you see it pop up and you get that little snap to them. And that's, a, that's one way of using fill flash to just uh, improve your photograph uh, in, in, in still lit conditions, but give them a little extra light to give it a little pop. And the same thing when you're shooting birds in cavities, uh, a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of shadow a little bit of flash will uh, will light up the cavity, and you'll have a, a more pleasing image and more detail on the animal. So uh, we're talking about aperture of the lenses now. Now aperture just means the size of the opening of the lens. So uh, you can adjust this on the camera or on the lens in some cases if you want to do it totally manually. Uh, but if you're looking at letting light into the lens, the aperture. If you have a small aperture, which is a when you really drop the amount of light that comes into the lens. This will allow or require longer shutter speeds, but it gives you maximum depth of field. So in other words, uh, if you shoot at small apertures, more of the frame is gonna be in focus if you stop it down like that. And this is important to do when you're, you're shooting things like scenics. So here's a shot of the Sweetgrass Hills in Montana. Um, and I wanted to show the prairie uh, in focus in the foreground, but I also wanted to get detail on the Sweetgrass Hills in the background. So, in this case, I put my camera on a tripod and I restrict the amount of light making a very small, small aperture. And this gives me maximum depth of field. And this allows everything in the frame to be in some form of focus. If you had, if you open the lens up, you're gonna have far less uh, of uh, depth of field and it's gonna be not nearly as pleasing an image. This is a good example too, when you're using uh, telephotos, you have to be very careful uh, because the depth of field in telephotos is very shallow. So if I wanted to have both of these uh, king eider ducks, this is on uh, Cambridge, uh, near Cambridge Bay in the Canadian Arctic, I want both of these ducks to be in focus and I'm shooting with a um, 600 millimeter f4 lens. And if I was to just shoot this wide open, like the biggest opening I could, I'm only going to get one of those ducks in focus. So even though that's the female duck is only behind the male here uh, by six inches or so, uh, I have to shoot this with the smallest aperture I can in order to get the, both of the ducks in focus. So you have to think about those things if you have more than one subject in a, in a, in a telephoto image and you want as much depth of field as you can. And that's, that's important to think. So you, the smaller the aperture, the greater the depth of field. And that works both in scenics and in situations where you have more than one subject in the frame. So what happens when you have your large aperture, just let as much light into that lens as possible. You're gonna have faster shutter speeds for sure, but you're gonna have a tiny amount of depth of field. And that's okay if you have just a single image in the lens. And there's a number of uh, techniques that wildlife photographers use by just shooting wide open, like uh, just leave, leave the lens with as large an aperture as, as you can get. And for example, you want tremendous speed. Here's a hawk owl diving. And you can see that the, the hawk owl is in focus to some degree and the, uh, the, the branch it just left is actually out of focus to some degree. That's because the depth of field is so shallow because I needed high speed and a lot of light entering the lens uh, into the camera to, to freeze the motion. I wanted a shot of it stooping like a peregrine falcon. And you can see that even though the tree that it left 
is only a, a less than a foot behind it, it's not going to be in focus. So I have the bird in focus, but uh, with that type of speed and having the lens wide open, I'm not able to uh, keep it uh, keep them both in focus. So and you, this technique is actually used to make subjects pop. If you're looking at um, uh, shooting a, uh, a photograph, say a portrait of a bird, uh, if you do this, keep the aperture well open, and especially with uh, you know moderate range telephotos, you uh, you will get uh, the bird in focus, but the background will be nicely blurred out. And here's an example. This is a baby sawed owl. You can see I've shot this wide open, uh, as much uh, aperture as I can get, and that shallows up the depth of field so that nothing in the background is visibly uh, in focus. Nothing is in focus other than the perch and the bird, and it makes the subject pop out of the uh, uh, the frame. Same here is a hawk owl, um, uh, wide open again uh, with the lens, uh, pr probably at the maximum aperture was probably a f4 or f2.8, uh, very, very uh, wide open, lots of light coming in, but again, very shallow depth of field because of those, because of the way you use the lens. You can see the tail of this bird isn't even in focus. So the depth of field, very, very narrow, but it makes for that beautifully soft background and makes the subject pop from the page. So high speed photography, uh, telephoto lenses are great. Uh, much of the autofocus that we're getting is much, much better. It gets better every year. Um, and if you have um, a nice clean background, like a snow surface or a beach surface, your autofocus for, or, or even the sky, uh, nothing in, in the background, the autofocus can work very, very well. And it's very gratifying to shoot pictures of flying birds, for example. And you want to avoid backgrounds where there's lots of contrast, like uh, trees uh, or, uh, or anything has a strong line in it because the camera will be fooled into focusing on that rather than your bird. Here's a good example. This is uh, 10, 15 years old now, but this was a Nikon D3, I think, with a 300 millimeter 2.8. Uh, and the bird was coming in to be trapped. Uh, the guy standing uh, just uh, behind me had, the, had the, and the net going. And I was in front with the camera and the bird flew right over me. But because the background was clean and just snow, that camera was able to get every photograph, I think at nine frames per second for about uh, well, probably 30 meters and got every one of them in focus perfectly. So that technology has really come a long ways and you can get some neat stuff uh, with that. Flying birds, again, that is some of the funnest stuff you can do. A good example too. Uh, here's another clean background, white bird on a white background. As, uh, should be a, uh, a photographic disaster. Um, you shouldn't be able to get enough contrast to follow a bird like that. But if you have enough contrast in the bird's body and, and, and no contrast in the background, you can get these shots with modern autofocus cameras. Uh, I would also say dramatic focus oh, photographs are always uh, shoot the ugly stuff, you know, sometimes acts of predation or fighting bad animal behavior that involves aggression. It's not always that fun to, to do, but it makes for dramatic photographs and also bad weather, snow and rain, wind. Uh, if you capture it, it can make for some very, very dramatic uh, photographs. And uh, it's, people like to check their cameras often, but uh, if you can protect your camera and shoot in bad weather, I, I definitely recommend it. Here's a, here's a shot of a Northern goshawk feeding young. And this is a, obviously not the, if you're a pigeon fancy or not the easiest thing to look at, but predation is the one thing that uh, is, makes for dramatic uh, photographs. Uh, this is an unusual photograph of a Delhi penguin having just killed a South Polar skua chick, which is usually the opposite of what we think of when it comes to penguins. Uh, but this is an example of a, an ugly event, but a rare one. And again, it's a documentation of a, uh, uh, it's material evidence of uh, an event that occurs and maybe people wouldn't believe you if you didn't have a photograph, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's evidence nonetheless. And uh, here's another good one too. This is a leopard seal having just uh, uh, finished up with an Adelie penguin. And this is something, again, you're documenting an event. It's a predation, it's not that fun to think of, but uh, for years and years, since people uh, had uh, known of the leopard seal, they watched them eating and they watched them skinning penguins and they assumed that they skinned the penguin and then, uh, and, uh, then uh, threw away the skin and ate the penguin. What's well, exactly opposite of what happens and this one has already been skinned. They are simply interested in the skin and the uh, fat on the skin and they throw away the penguin. So they're eating the skin, throwing away the penguin. And I just took this photograph to show that you know, this is a, uh, an event of predation that's over. Uh, the, the leper seal has eaten everything he wants from that penguin. Another example of a, 
not the prettiest thing to be shooting, but it definitely a dramatic photograph or a dramatic uh, uh, realization from that photograph. A good thing too, if you wanted to uh, feature environmental issues, this is the, uh, uh, the one of the largest ble uh, bleach craft uh, pulp mills in the world. Uh, you can see to the right hand side a pile of mature aspen trees there that uh, taken per spring is probably 150 feet high and uh, nearly a quarter mile long. And that's a lot of trees, a lot of habitat. And if you want to make the the, uh, the case for North American uh, wood or tree or forest management uh, being affected or being large, uh, it's very, very much the case. And this is the type of thing you would uh, uh, use to illustrate that. And I've done this several times with this particular photograph. Uh, here's a good example uh, of uh, not a, a pretty thing as well, but again, if you wanted to feature uh, the risk that birds have when it comes to collisions with uh, man-made objects. This is a, a good one to illustrate as well. I've used this one as well for pe people uh, wanting the information on uh, the dangers of power lines near certain breeding bird populations. And, and uh, this has happened to be a, a short-eared owl that hit a power line right beside a, a sagebrush lek where the birds were, uh, in both, both species were uh, in danger of, of hurting themselves or, or killing themselves on power lines. Just an example. And here's another one we used. <clears throat> I took this uh, uh, using a, this is a, a setup photograph uh, trying to draw attention to uh, poisoning in bald eagles, inadvertent poisoning by uh, veterinary drugs not being in cow carcasses of, of euthanized animals not being uh, disposed of properly. I shot this picture of a beautiful bald eagle uh, about to be um, cannibalized or, or uh, uh, subject to uh, scavenging by a magpie, uh, just to show uh, the concern or the, the potential for for uh, these eagles to be killed in uh, by not disposing of veterinary drug, drugs properly. So, and also uh, the uh, weather conditions I mentioned before, uh, if if your snow and rain and that sort of thing are um, uh, are a problem or for your camera, but they also deliver in some great images as well. And uh, here's a couple of examples. Here's a, as a friend of mine, that this is what we want to uh, uh, illustrate, you know, how we, we go out and capture owls in the wintertime. And I mentioned that we sometimes don't uh, uh, push it or I push it a little bit with the, the car uh, and, and the conditions. And this is what, uh, here's my pal, uh, just uh, about to uh, capture a great gray owl in the wintertime for banding. And um, it illustrates uh, uh, just what we're doing out there and how a little bit of crazy we can be at, at certain times. Uh, <clears throat> here's another example of a, a shot uh, taken in a snowstorm. If this neat thing is this boreal owl, you can actually see, uh, I think I'm above the left eye there, you can see the, uh, 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 the snowflakes that are actually, if you look closely enough, you can see they're actually, you can, a perfect snowflake right above the left eye there. Uh, again, it's just a little something extra, but taking your camera out during a snowstorm, shooting shooting one thing or another, and you're, uh, uh, you're able to bring back something that's a little bit different than the average a person might get. And here's another one. This is a uh, hurricane in the Antarctic, the catabatic winds coming off the uh, Antarctic Plateau. Probably wind speeds here are about 100, uh, 110 kilometers an hour, whipping up some pretty good surf and some, uh, some pretty uh, moving some of these birds along quite smartly. Uh, it's just a, a shot of uh, ugly conditions, but uh, certainly not something you want to take your camera out in all the time, but it is a, does give a bit of a dramatic flair to the, uh, to the photograph. So another example, uh, the, uh, this is at a bird blind uh, with a crash of a Delhi penguin babies and two very experienced the South Polar School is about to try and uh, take one another. And uh, uh, the, bird, the fellow that shot the blind, put up the blind here was, uh, uh, was not happy with the conditions because it was snowing and it was cold and uh, he went inside and I went in the blind and this is exactly when the uh, uh, the action started and with the uh, snow and and wind and uh, that sort of thing it, it made a for a much more dramatic uh, and pleasing photograph than it would have if we had waited uh, until the snow stopped and and the snow melted because uh, this was a pre uh, midsummer snowstorm in Antarctica. And don't forget the people as well. I mean, I use a lot of, uh, of people in photographs to illustrate things. I, I uh, worked on um, uh, old, old growth uh, retention in, in uh, boreal forests or Southern mixed wood boreal forests in, in Alberta. This is the largest tree we have that will form a hole 
this is a balsam poplar. Uh, you can try and uh, illustrate this by saying, oh, it's got to be 45 centimeters of breast height, all the rest of it. You don't have to say a thing when the photograph just shows you it's an old tree with a lot big hole in it, and you've got a big hole in it, and you need a, if it's a barred owl nest, it's a, an owl the size of a loaf of bread, it's going to need a big hole, but you, you don't have to say too much more if you have a good photograph there. Here's a good example too. Here's the loaf of bread, a barred owl, and two graduate students uh, putting a radio transmitter on a barred owl. And as these guys were pretty well nocturnal for most of their uh, graduate lives. Uh, but if you wanted to illustrate what it's like to be out there following barred owls during the night, and, uh, and actually in this case, uh, capturing them for telemetry, um, you just uh, use a photograph. It's a far easier thing to do than to try and explain it to someone. There are emerging areas I just finish off here with a few things that maybe suggest to you that areas that you might want to specialize in yourselves. Uh, native fish, you can visit the aquarium, uh, aquariums near you, and with digital technology, and again, some of the flash technology, experiment with it, you can get some beautiful photographs of native fish uh, in, in uh, aquaria from around the North America. Uh, small mammals, if you try and get uh, pictures of some small mammals that you just cannot get them, they'll usually be a study skin or they'll be dead, uh, pictures of dead specimens. If you can, uh, if you run into some situation where you get a chance to photograph small mammals, excellent thing to do because there's um, very, very few good pictures of small mammals. Vascular and non-vascular plants, a lot of people like to take pictures of many plants at a time. Uh, some detailed images of in individual plants are probably tougher to get than you might think. And then invertebrates, other than the well-photographed butterflies and dragonflies, are also ones that you would want to, uh, uh, might want to specialize. Things like grasshoppers, for example. Uh, here's a good example. This is an Arctic grayling taken at the local aquarium in, in Alberta here. Uh, quite a pretty fish. Uh, again, uh, experimenting with the digital technology and flash, we were able to get a nice shot of it. Uh, small mammals. This is a sagebrush vole. You try and get a picture of a sagebrush vole, it's hard. This one fell down a boot track <laughs> and got caught in a boot hole in the snow. And so we uh, pulled him out of there and uh, gave him something to eat and then put him on a rock and took a picture of him. And, uh, that's probably one of the few pictures of a live sagebrush wool you're going to see and very useful uh, uh, when the time comes. So, and certainly interesting for people, small mammal people who are looking for photographs. Uh, Calypso orchid here, small orchids that are in the boreal forest, tiny little things. But again, if you um, were able to invest in maybe a macro lens uh, for your camera and you were able to get out there, you could uh, certainly spend the day on the forest floor picking off some really nice photographs of, uh, of native plants that are uh, not all that well celebrated often. <clears throat> and again, these are uh, just pictures of a, a kestrel nest. I would have, uh, I would have, I would have just died to uh, know what they were eating here. These were beautiful little uh, uh, gra or gra grasshoppers that these guys were eating and uh, they were doing very well on it, but I never did get a good chance to see what the uh, uh, the grasshopper was, but if I'd caught one or been able to get one, I would have definitely spent some time to photograph. So in all, I can say the, the last message I would say is always carry your camera wherever you're going and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll do with it. If you are, are in possession of your camera, that's when you're going to have some opportunities. And a good example, my best example here was the uh, uh, long tail weasel. Uh, I went out on New Year's Eve one night to, to photograph deer falcons and I ran into a uh, long tail weasel and winter pelage and I'll tell you I had to drive all the way back home and get a camera and fortunately for me the animal was still there and uh, I did get some pictures of it so it is uh, I, I told my wife if uh, if I leave the the, uh, the house without this camera this big lens has hit me over the head with it because it, it, uh, it was almost a blown opportunity but uh, always try and carry that camera and most of all have fun it's a great great passionate a passion of mine and it will uh, it, it will uh, provide hours of fun either outdoors working uh, animals for photographs or plants for photographs but also when you're back home processing your digital images and it, it's a great great hobby and it's a fast growing hobby so um, uh, carry your camera and and have some fun that's about all I have for you today Casey <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gord. So I have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so do you have any tips or tricks for people who might not have a digital camera, but have a smartphone or something along those lines that might help them take some like backyard photography? 
Certainly, yeah. As I mentioned, some of the cell phones now have, have tremendous uh, uh, cameras and lenses in them and also have uh, some adjustability to them as well. I would experiment with your cell phone, whether you're you know, outdoors, take a quarter or a penny and see how close you can get to it. Taking pictures of insects, for example, with a cell phone may well be possible because there's the close focusing distances are, are quite impressive with some of them. And they, uh, they don't, uh, you know, they, they, they do deliver some very good images. So uh, uh, flowers as well, uh, bees, um, uh, you know, a variety of insects with the cell phone. I certainly think you can uh, experiment in your own backyard with, with a cell phone. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gord Court. We loved having you as a partner today. Uh, learning about all of the photography tips and tricks were super helpful. So that is all the time that we have for today. But before we go, I wanted to share an opportunity with you to get involved in Earth Day awareness and nature photography. So another great way to participate in conservation awareness this month is by visiting the Nature's Best Photography website. On this website, you will find multiple resources that show you the best methods for nature photography, as well as articles on recent endeavors that photographers have gone on. Browse this website for helpful how-tos and beautiful works of art using a lens and camera. Well, that is all the time that we have for this live stream, but we will see you next Tuesday as we continue to talk about celebrating Earth Day through nature photography at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time with our partner, City of Springfield Environmental Services. Don't forget to tune in and remember to protect our Earth. We will see you then. Thank you.